All right, Titus for Beginners, uh, lesson number three in this series, the last one in the series, a pattern for sound preaching, Titus 2, verse one to Titus chapter three, verse uh, 15. So in the, uh, in the first chapter of Titus, Paul describes the important tasks that this young preacher must attend to so that he can set in order what has not been done or what had not been done while Paul was there working with him. Paul encouraged uh, Titus to uh, set leaders, we call them, or the Bible called them elders or bishops or pastors or overseers, there are many different words that refer to the same uh, individual. Uh, so to set these men uh, as leaders in churches located in each city on the island of Crete. Titus was also instructed to silence and refute the teachings of various false teachers that were troubling the church uh, where he served. Paul shows Titus that the proper and effective response to false teaching is not arguing and debating, but rather the presentation of sound teaching. And in the following section, the apostle gives Titus an example or a pattern of the type of sound teaching that he can confidently follow. You, you answer these false teachers with good teaching, sound teaching, and here's a sample of this type of teaching. Basically, this is what uh, Paul is saying to Titus. So he begins by giving Titus an example of sound and very practical teaching that addresses the proper attitude to cultivate in order to have peace and respect among all the members in the church. So we read chapter two, verse one, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. So he sets it up right here. This is what you ought to be teaching. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips or enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, uh, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. So a long list of things mentioned, a very compact section, um, and in this section, Paul addresses every, demograph every demographic uh, uh, in the church of that era. Um, one last uh, verse here, uh, urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. There we go, now we have all the, the demographics of individuals that were in the church. So who does he talk to or who does he talk about? Well, he talks about older men and he teaches what, what should older, and of course the thing here in brackets is older Christian men. Men who are not Christian may strive for these things, yes or no, but if you're a Christian, if you're an older man as a Christian, then this is what you should be striving for, Paul says. You should be dignified, dependable uh, in your knowledge of the word, uh, having a loving attitude and not easily moved or swayed. Uh, older women should be respectful of God and their husbands, careful with their speech and conduct, wise in their advice to uh, younger women. Married women, godly, devoted to husbands and home and family, examples of purity and humility and industry. In other words, not just they must stay in the home. You know, some people unfortunately use this passage to, uh, to prove a false idea that women are not allowed to go out and work. Uh, that's not what he's saying. He's saying the women who are at home should be workers at home. It's not, they should only work at home, it should be if they're at home, they should be workers at home, not lazy. Uh, he talks to the uh, young men, uh, married or not, they're to be sensible, meaning serious-minded, not impulsive or ruled by their emotions. 
And then he talks to Titus himself. And in Titus, he talks to all those who minister in the church, that they should provide an example of spiritual maturity. And how do they do this? Well, with good deeds and good teaching delivered in a humble and dignified manner. Not giving opponents, meaning unbelievers or enemies of the church or doubters, not giving these people any opportunity to condemn your teaching or to condemn your teaching through your attitude. You know, a lot of times people won't accept your teaching because you, you may be teaching the right thing, but you've got the wrong attitude. And so Paul encourages Titus to have not only the right teaching, but also to have the right attitude uh, in his teaching. He says, let your manner of living actually cause others embarrassment if they are attacking you in the first place. And then he mentions slaves at the end of, his, of this passage. Slaves who were believers had a responsibility to render a good witness of their sincere faith since they were not in a position to engage their masters in a conversation with the purpose of teaching or trying to convert them. So if you were a believing slave and you were enslaved to a non-believing you know, master, you couldn't go up to him and just say, let me tell you how it is. Hey, you want to study the Bible with me? I'm going to teach you. You couldn't do that. It wasn't done. I'm not saying that, wasn't, that was right. I'm just saying it wasn't done in that society. And so Paul is giving believing slaves a strategy for winning over their masters purely based on their conduct. Much like a woman married to a non-believer uh, that Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, that their witness was made through their actions rather than their words. These would include service done in sincerity with a positive attitude, being trustworthy, reliable, so that his or her service would confirm and highlight their faith, not detract from their faith. So the master would see how their Christian servant worked and would see a difference between how their Christian service, uh, uh, servants operated and served and their non-Christian uh, servants operated or served. And it, you know, it follows through today, doesn't it? We're hoping that as Christian employees, we're working for other people, that the boss will notice our faith by the way we work for them and not just by what we're saying or the fact that we have a Bible at our desk or something like that. That's all fine and good. But uh, the proof of the pudding is what kind of, uh, what kind of employee are you uh, as, a, as a Christian? So this type of teaching did not deal with theological issues. It did not deal with you know, religious uh, mysteries or debates on various topics. It was simple, even mundane type of teaching because it spoke to normal people about their conduct at, as Christians in everyday life. There's nothing spectacular about this type of teaching, but this is the type of teaching that Christians needed. Everyday Christians needed this type of teaching to help them live their Christian lives uh, you know, in an everyday manner. However, Paul uses this teaching as an example of what he calls sound teaching, solid teaching. Sound or healthy in the Greek um, uh, means healthy. When the Greek word here, another meaning would be healthy teaching. Uh, healthy teaching makes for healthy uh, members. So Paul has given uh, Titus uh, an example of healthy teaching or sound teaching that addresses the practical needs of this and every church that Titus will serve. And you know, we can take this teaching and apply it to ourselves today, and it works, right? It, it's applicable today. The apostle then moves on from an example of sound teaching to the pattern or the basic blueprint upon which all teaching needs to be based uh, on or measured against. So in verses 11 to 15, he's going to summarize the essence of the gospel so that Titus can be reminded of the core ideas that will provide the guidance for whatever he teaches in the future. You know, uh, just to kind of make a parenthetical statement here about pattern theology, I am a believer in pattern theology. Uh, pattern theology, the idea that in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you have a pattern, you have a blueprint for how things are done. 
So if you want to say, well, how should, we, how should we do the communion, for example? How should we do that? Well, you, know, you look through the New Testament and you study all the examples and instances where the church was serving the communion, and, and out of those teachings, a, a pattern arises that teaches you, that demonstrates how to do the communion. You know, we, we take the unleavened bread and we take the, the fruit of the vine, we do it on the Lord's day, everybody participates in it. You know, we, 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 we get some direction for how to do things. How should we organize the church? Who should lead the church? What are the roles in the church? The New Testament has a pattern or a blueprint that teaches us all these things. So that idea you know, is called pattern theology, right? And so in the Churches of Christ, we use this idea in order to come to conclusions about various uh, matters. So I'm a supporter of pattern theology and I believe that Paul provides here the pattern for the basic doctrine that sound elders and preachers are to teach and which produces strong Christians and healthy growing churches. So the New Testament pattern for our theology is the teaching concerning God's grace. The New Testament pattern for our theology is the teaching concerning God's grace. It's the framework upon which everything else is built. Here in this passage here, Paul describes five features regarding grace that needs to be taught, that needs to be taught. All right, so we'll go through these first. The appearance of God's grace, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's the first and basic theological principle of Christianity. The preaching of the good news as it was prophesied by the Old Testament prophets and fully proclaimed by the apostles. Before men were in darkness, they were slaves to ignorance and tossed about by every myth and philosophy imagined. But now the truth about life and sin and death and salvation and man and creation and God who rules over it all has been revealed and made plain for all to see. I'm going to jump out of Titus and I'm going to go to Romans here for a passage, Romans 16, 25. Paul says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, against this revelation we measure sound doctrine. Now we not only know who God is, but we also know how He is. Not a vindictive, petulant warrior or an aloof creator, but a loving, merciful God who is gracious and kind to sinners. Therefore, the appearance of grace reminds me, or removes me rather, from the realm of ignorance once and for all. I don't have to figure everything out by sheer intellectual might. God has revealed the basic mystery of life to me through the gospel. The light that I have must be the light of grace or I am still in the darkness. So that's the basic principle of our theology. Through Jesus Christ, the light has been revealed and what has it revealed? that God is a gracious God. That's what it has revealed. Number two, the instruction of God's grace, verse 12. This instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What does the revelation of grace teach us? It teaches us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, so on and so forth. So grace not only reveals who and how God is, it also instructs me who and how I need to live as a Christian. How should I live according to the revelation that I've received? Now the Gnostics, you know, the Gnostic teachers, they either followed the path of total denial 
or total indulgence. But grace teaches me how to live as a spiritual being in a material world. Yes, of course, we have to deny some things. We have to deny ungodliness, you know, disbelief, paganism. We have to deny sinful desires, which are essentially disobedience to God. However, our life is not all about denial. There are things we do have open access to. We can indulge in those things that are wholesome and good and conducive to joy and thanksgiving provided by God for our happiness and pleasure. There are many more things in life that we can indulge in than we have to deny ourselves. So the gospel provides me with the instruction that I need to alter my life in order to live the Christian life. It is a guide. My teaching needs to reflect what grace teaches and what grace permits. Very important. We also need to teach about, concerning grace, the expectation of God's grace. Verse 13. He says, looking for the blessed, what does grace hope for? Well, it says here, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Again, we'll jump out of Titus and go to another passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Paul in that passage says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. The world of unbelievers has many ideas about death, many stories about seeing you know, a white light at the end of a tunnel. They make movies and they speculate night and day about what happens after death, but they have no hope. None of these movies give you hope. What is hope? Biblical hope. It is a confident expectation. None of these things None of these speculations about what happens after death given to us by the world creates hope in us. The gospel, as seen in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, brings us hope despite the experience of death. I fully expect to live after I die. There is no wavering on this point. I am a follower of Jesus because of this one hope the promise of eternal life. People don't become Christians because they'll have the privilege of going to church three times a week for the rest of their lives. We go to church, why? To keep our faith strong, that's why. I want my faith to be strong because if my faith is strong, then my hope is alive. That's why I go, it's a means to an end. It's not an end to itself. And so, Grace motivates me to look beyond this life, to make decisions based on an eternal perspective, to live joyfully in a world filled with death because I know that death is not the master over me. Jesus Christ is the master over me and He is also the master over my death. And so my hope is based on grace and nothing else, not my work, not my intelligence, not even my affiliation. So what's the point here? The point here, as far as Titus is concerned, this is what needs to be taught. This is what sound doctrine sounds like. Number four, the purpose of God's grace, verse 14 who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good deeds. For what reason has the mystery been revealed to us? Why? For what reason have we been instructed in the ways of godly living? For what reason does God allow us a glimpse into the eternal future that is grace's hope. Why? Why grace? Why grace? 
that He, through grace, might save us from being destroyed forever in hell, that He might restore us as a holy people with whom He could have a relationship, that He might, through us, bless others with His kindness. That's why grace is revealed to us. You know, in the beginning, in Genesis, it was love that created us through Jesus Christ that we might have a blessed relationship with God and one another. That's what Paul says in Colossians 1.16. Now it is love working through grace that recreates us in Jesus Christ so that we can once again have a blessed relationship with God and also with one another. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. You know, what's it all, what is it all about? The revelation of grace and Jesus. And what's the end game? Well, the end game is that we renew our uninhibited relationship with God that has been broken because of sin. That's the point. That's what all of this is about. We don't initiate it. We don't have the power to initiate it. God has initiated it. We had a relationship you know, described in Genesis we had an intimate relationship with God at one point, which was broken because of sin. And so all of this, the, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, all the history, all the work, all the, when I say work, I mean by God through Christ, all of it has, has, has what end? Well, to restore us back to that relationship so that we can enjoy an, a conscious, loving relationship with our Creator without reference to sin or weakness. So my teaching needs to reflect hope and salvation and love, not issues and personalities and systems. That's the point you know, of, 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 the, uh, of the teaching that uh, Paul is giving to Titus. Number five. <laughs> the authority of God's grace. So we've been talking about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, what is sound teaching about? Well, it's about grace. Grace is the framework for all of our, our teaching. And we've said the five features of grace, its appearance, instruction, expectation, purpose, and now its authority. Verse 15, these things, he says, speak and exhort and reprove with all authority let no one disregard you. So grace is God's final dealing with man. This is the pattern for the relationship between man and God. No further teaching, no improvements. We are commissioned to preach grace and we shouldn't make excuses for this. The sophisticated, the philosophers, the scoffers, the legalists, all seem to find the higher platforms for their message, but their message is not authorized by God. The preaching of God's grace revealed to men is the Great Commission and will always be needed and supported by God. If this is your message, then don't be afraid and don't apologize, he says. My teaching needs to reflect grace without fear of men's opinions. In the balance of the book, Paul describes how the grace of God manifests itself in people's lives in the church because sound teaching equals sound Christians. So now he's going to talk about the fruit of sound doctrine based on grace. First of all, he says, sound Christians are model Christians. Chapter three, he says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. And so sound Christians are model citizens. Another thing he says, sound Christians are highly motivated, he says, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. 
but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. So sound Christians are highly motivated. They're, motiv they're motivated by their past, he says. You know, he talked about their past, not to repeat it. They're motivated by their salvation, to draw strength from it. And they're motivated by their actions, positive reinforcement. The more I do good, the more I want to do good. The closer I draw to God, the closer I want to be to Him. And then he says, sound Christians reject unsound teaching, verses nine to 11. He says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So don't be afraid to recognize and reject those people and teachings that are contrary to grace. You know, many times we argue over procedure and personal issues instead of the real issues that need to be, uh, need to be debated. And of course, this teaching and these ideas are specifically uh, uh, geared toward who? Well, towards Titus, and he's supposed to be teaching this to those who will be leaders in the church. And so those who are leaders in the church need to focus on these ideas, to promote these ideas and teach these things in order to build the church uh, spiritually. And unfortunately, what happens? Life gets in the way, right? I mean, the roof leaks, uh, you know, the, the youth minister uh, crashes the, the church van or something, and all of a sudden you know, the, the emergency stuff takes over and you know, countless hours are taken to do those type of things. Uh, but we have to remember that these are the things that are primary and, and most important, even though they don't sound urgent at times. So Paul finishes the letter with uh, personal requests and instructions in verse 12. He says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. And so the apostle is moving his workers you know, from place to place, sending either Tychicus or Artemis to replace Titus in Crete so they can meet up in the port city of Nicopolis. Uh, Paul was probably needing Titus' help for a work there for which we have no further information. We don't know everything Paul did. We just know some of what he did. In verse 13 and 14, he says, diligently help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs, so that they will not be unfruitful. Again, we have no information on Zenos, which is a Greek name, a lawyer, probably a lawyer of Old Testament law, not necessarily civil law. Uh, who had been converted and was now being sent along with Apollos, we know about Apollos in Acts 18 and 1 Corinthians, uh, who had been taught by Aquila and Priscilla. These were now Paul's assistants, preparing to go on a mission of which we have no information. Again, mission trip, we don't know where, what. Paul instructs Titus to equip them with all that they may need. Well, what will they need? Well, they need money, clothing, food, equipment, contacts, for both their journey and their mission. These resources gathered from church members, much like we do today, when we send people out on a campaign or a missionary effort out in the field, same, same idea. Paul notes that this work provides an opportunity for the Christians in Crete to do a good work and to produce spiritual fruit. His point is that they can take the initiative to do this and demonstrate their zeal in doing good works. 
The exercise of giving will do them some spiritual good, he says. It'll be a good learning exercise. And then in verse 15 he says, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace, once again, grace be with you all. So he sends greetings to Titus on behalf of all those who are with him traveling through Macedonia on their way to Nicopolis. He also sends greetings to the brethren at Crete. Um, his blessing is brief, but it's all encompassing. Again, he uses the term grace as a compact word that contains all of the blessings of the Christian faith. Forgiveness, peace, joy, eternal life with God, all of those things compressed into a single word, grace. There can be no greater blessing to bestow on anyone, no matter the time or the place. Well, a couple of uh, lessons here uh, from this uh, final uh, section of Titus and this uh, final lesson in the series. Lesson number one, sound leaders preaching sound doctrine produce sound or healthy churches. That's the formula, it's not very complicated. Churches that are dwindling or divided or discouraged are usually having problems with sound leaders or sound teaching. Sound teaching is the lifeblood of the church from infant to adult. Sound leadership provides example and motivation for the church. When either of these are lacking, the result is easily seen in the church. Poor attendance, lack of giving, low service, low enthusiasm, so on and so forth. Sound leaders preaching sound doctrine produce sound and healthy churches. Number two, sound doctrine is measured by God's grace. You know, they, uh, they have uh, key questions uh, you know, in politics when somebody is vying for the leadership of a party or something like that, they go through a whole process and they answer questions. You know, how are you on gun rights? Or how are you on uh, abortion rights or taxes? You know, they ask him questions to get a feel for you know, what is his position? Is this a man or a woman that we would like to see as a, a candidate? You know, they, they go through that. Well, in the church, you know, uh, if we want to find out the soundness of a person, a soundness of a teacher. It's measured by their teaching on grace. What do they believe about God's grace? What's its purpose? So if your teaching content or style contradicts or does not conform to the gospel of grace, it will not produce genuine spiritual fruit. Legalism, which is the opposite, produces fruit, but it produces fruit through pride and fear and guilt. Only grace produces a desire in my heart to be righteous, and that desire is satisfied through faith in Christ. Grace not only creates a felt desire in me to be righteous, and I can't emphasize that enough. Legalism does not produce in me the desire to do what's right. Only grace of God and the teaching on grace produces in me the desire to do what is right. And it also enables me to be righteous by faith in Christ apart from works. That's the teaching of grace. Well, to God be the glory in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. And the class said? Amen. There we go, for those at home. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs>